Sinatra had basked and was about to bask even more in the warm glow of Kennedy's celebrity. We need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode 15. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Welcome to the new kind of KFM, the story KFM, where I dump on you all of the juicy, lovely, fun anecdotal stories that don't fit into the main episode, but are so insightful. It will kind of be like KFM 14, where we did with Peter Lawford. We just told all those random little stories. One example is this quote from Jack. This is from the Kennedy women. As attorney general, Bobby was making the most single-minded attack on organized crime in American history, which we will also be telling you the context and the story of that. He warned Jack time and time again about Sinatra's unsavory connections. Quote, Everybody complains about my relationship with Sinatra. Jack confided to Charles Bartlett. Sinatra is the only guy who gives Peter Lawford jobs. And the only way I can keep this marriage going is to see that Peter gets jobs. So I'm nice to Frank Sinatra. Jack then may have compromised himself in large part to help his sister. And it's like, we're wondering why are you freaking involved with Frank Sinatra? That seems so stupid. And on the surface, it just seems like, oh, he doesn't give a crap. He's just like having fun and enjoying himself, like with the affairs, like with all the other scandalous things that he's doing. He's just there to have a, have a good time and to party. Sinatra, Sinatra is the only guy who gives Peter Lawford jobs. And the only way I can keep this marriage going, Jack, the president of the United States, the only way I can keep my sister's marriage going is to see that Peter gets jobs. So I'm nice to Frank Sinatra. And that is totally how Joe Sr. played the game as well. Even though they knew it was like stupid and they were annoyed with it, they knew that that's how like life was rigged kind of. Yeah, it's like, you know, I understand the risks, but- People are people. It's like all intertwined and messy and they knew how to freaking so, navigate that. So, so it's well. like Bobby had more empathy in some contexts and it seemed like he was more emotional and saw people more in some ways. But mm-hmm. then Jack saw people more in other ways that Bobby was not literate in. Uh huh. So there are so many little tiny stories like that, that just it, to me, it gives so much more context. It's so interesting. I, I want to know all of it, uh-huh. but to fit it all into a main episode is just, I mean, we'd literally be here for freaking ever. Years. So utilizing this KFM space to get to tell all these random little stories that don't necessarily thread together in like a, a main big overarching story, but just fill in those little gaps and just give you that extra depth of I'm sorry. What did he say? Johnny, I'm sorry. Or whatever he said to, whatever Frank said to Peter, you know? Yes. Like oh my I gosh. couldn't really fit that into Pat and Peter's timeline with how Charlie. fast everything Charlie, Charlie, Charlie there you go. Charlie, uh, Charlie, I'm sorry. That just like breaks me. And so I want to tell those stories, but. And it gives such a better picture too, because we definitely obviously had a wrong view of who Pat was. And uh, with a lot of them, Mm -hmm. yeah, you look at the surface and you see... If you're involved in Hollywood and that's the life you chose, then uh, clearly, obviously, you're vain. Yeah, exactly. And like we've talked about before with this fear that some of Pat's most selfish decisions were her most selfless decisions. And then here you go with this quote about Jack Mm -hmm. and one of his, what looks to be like a selfish, stupid, immature decision of hanging out with Frank and looks like it's bad move for his career. His wife doesn't want to. He looks like he's being irresponsible and not taking into account other people. The consequences, other people, what's going to transpire from how this looks. Oh, no, 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 no. He thought about that and he's thought a level deeper. Yeah, and he's still okay with it and that's the sacrifice. (sighs) And so his most selfish decisions end up being selfless. And I feel like that is almost always what it is with the Kennedys. You can't take anything Mm -hmm. for what it looks like. You have to dig eight levels deeper. And these little anecdotes are what help that. 
So we're trying to line all of these timelines up, all the things that we've talked about, where Rosemary was, where Joe Jr. was, where Kick was, where Bobby was. Which is even just that is crazy to think about because they were all still alive. Literally yes. every single one of them was still in the timeline. You know how whenever you're watching like a documentary or something and then there'll be like that tape measure, like timeline that scrolls across the screen mm-hmm. and then like calibrates. Shows you where you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And That's what, what I'm before, imagining. What goes after. Uh-huh. <laughs> Every time I'm like, wait, what year is this? Or Bethany asks me, wait, how many kids does Bobby have at this point? I'm like, Shh. yep. <laughs> Finding where we are, mm-hmm. locating. Okay. Here. So pinpoint, let's start with like 1945 ish. And we'll give you the rundown of, of everything that kind of is going on. So in the episode, we mentioned that Bobby did actually have several experiences, several jobs, qualifications that prepped him to be able to execute the job of attorney general. And so we're going to kind of zoom through what Bobby was doing previous to Jack running for the house and what career path he was on. Because basically he was on the, I could be attorney general one day career path. He paused that to work for Jack And then he resumed that journey when Jack appointed him attorney general. So Bobby graduates high school. He goes to Harvard, as do all of the Kennedy boys. (laughs) Then he graduates. He goes into the Navy, which is when he was in his Navy uniform when Kick and Jack were drinking in the kitchen. Bobby walks in and he's like, I'm telling dad. Then he goes and tells on his adult siblings (laughs) that they're (laughs) drinking. And um, And the adult siblings get in trouble. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Red Faye was there and all of Jack's war buddies. And it was directly after they lost Joe Jr., but I think before they lost Billy. No, I... No, because remember, didn't didn't we say in in Kick's episodes that she was told not to leave? So it was Billy. So Billy died first? I think so. Okay. I'm not sure though. I'm not positive either. I know that. No, because Kick was in the US when Billy died. Yes. So and I think it was before, but it was like right at the same time. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was in the same war, but I think Joe Jr. died and then Kick went home and. Yeah, they told her that it looked bad that uh-huh. her husband was serving and you're leaving to go to America. Okay. Yeah. So Joe, Joe Jr. died first. And they lost Joe Jr. That's why Kick came home in the first place. Kick came home. And that's why Joe Sr. was in his room in the first place. Because otherwise he would have been hanging out with everyone. Yeah. But he was depressed. So he popped his head out the window and was like, you guys are making freaking a mockery and a fool of the house because all the neighbors can hear you giggling and laughing and your brother just died in the war. And Bobby's, that was Bobby's Bobby. the one who <laughs> yeah. alerted the, Joe. And Bobby's in his Navy uniform and he's like, Shame Black on you Robert, and your family. Black Robert. <laughs> <laughs> so then, after that era, he started attending law school, and Ethel and he got married right before he graduated law school in 1950. Which he's kind of continuing Joe Jr.'s path. Yeah, he was going to become a lawyer. Absolutely. Also, we will, of course, of course, of course, cover their love story because it probably is going to be the most fun and like. <gasps> and there's some Love shocking uh, details. Cassie already spoiled a little bit of it in, what was it, episode? Oh, yeah. 12? 11. 13. 13. <laughs> <laughs> in episode 13, that Bobby dated Ethel's sister, Pat Skakel, before he dated Ethel. Yeah. So I really am excited to get into that whole and dynamic. And it's in episode like- 15, we find out that Sergeant, no, not Sergeant. Oh my God. We find out that Peter Lawford dated Eunice before he dated Pat. That one is the more shocking one. <laughs> Whoever How thought that was a good idea. And why? It just wasn't. But anyway, that happened. And then he graduates from law school. Then he passes the Massachusetts bar in 1951. He was officially a lawyer. He worked for the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, and he was actually investigating Soviet spies at the time, which is. <laughs> Very 1960s of him. Yeah. Um, But that was before the 1960s. Next, he was transferred to Brooklyn, New York, and assigned as special assistant to the attorney general. So he's in New York while Eunice and Jack are in D.C. So that job gave him an inside look at 
basically what would be his future job. But I think he was just the assistant for the attorney general in New York, not, not the, the national. That's over everyone. Mm -hmm. But Pat probably was in New York at the same yes. time too. So two of them were in New York, at least two of them. Several of them were probably still in Boston. And then Jack and Eunice were in DC. DC. Wow, how fun. And Rosemary was in Wisconsin. But he gave up this job as assistant to the attorney general when he resigned to manage Jack's Senate campaign. Oh, because he loved his brother. <laughs> Then he was appointed by Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy to assistant counsel of the U.S. Senate Permanent Submittee. No, I can't even say it Permanent all. Okay. Subcommittee. Yes, the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. So this is where our episodes collide, where our worlds of Pat and Peter and Frank and Hollywood and the mafia intertwine with the political world of Jack and Bobby. So he and Jack, who were constantly getting confused by the public, Jack or Bobby, Bobby or Jack, Bobby Jack, the same thing. Okay. <laughs> they were fighting against Jimmy Hoffa and a man named Sam Giancana, who sometimes also maybe went by the name of Sam Flood. Wait, so this is the Sam Flood from Pat and Peter's episode. Yes. So back in early 1960, before Jack is president, he's still campaigning. Jack showed up with Teddy to meet Pat in Vegas. This is the trip that I mentioned in episode 14, where Jack met somebody who we still don't know how many consequences it had. Yes. This is the trip that they had dinner at Sinatra's table in the garden room of the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas and where a According to Judith Campbell, Jack was just taken with her. <laughs> okay, pause. I need some clarity. Okay, so Judith was a Hollywood groupie, okay? Her sister had been a mildly successful actress with roles in Perry Mason and Gunsmoke, those really, really early TV shows. And Judith wanted to follow in her sister's career. And she was beautiful. Like, she has dark, like black, shiny hair and bright blue eyes. Like she's gorgeous. She couldn't act worth crap. <laughs> oh, no. So instead she just hung around movie sets and because she was beautiful and charming, everyone let her hang. Mm -hmm. So when she was 18, she met an actor named William Campbell at a party. He was also mildly famous after he became the first man to sing on screen next to Elvis Presley. So this actually connects. Our Kardashian siblings to our Kennedy oh siblings. Oh my gosh. I actually have um, Elvis and Me yeah, we by need Priscilla to do a Presley episode. right behind me. We've got to because now she's connected to multiple stories. Stories. And if you don't remember, she dated Robert Kardashian. Yes, Kim's dad. After, after Elvis. After she dated Elvis. Yeah, because she was like. Well, after she was married to Elvis. When yeah. She was with Elvis. Did you see that there's a new movie coming out? Mm -mm. I think it's called Priscilla. Oh, wow. Really like that, but it's all about Priscilla Presley, her story. I want to watch that. So William Campbell, first guy to sing on camera with Elvis Presley in a movie. She met him at a party when she was 18. She married him. This marriage graduated her from groupie to Hollywood's inside circle. Okay, wow. I was thinking Priscilla Presley. I was like, she was 18. That does not track no, 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 with no. what I know about Priscilla Presley. Judith, Judith, Judith Campbell, Campbell married Campbell. William Campbell comes from yes kkk who is like a kind of like low b level actor like he had one kind of famous, exactly one hit wonder yeah. type okay but it was her ticket in and she was 18 and she was 18 so her marriage didn't last that long because she was 18 <laughs> <laughs> but she created a new life during that time that would last long past her relationship with william campbell <clears throat> because she met frank sinatra Okay. The Great Connector. So when Jack and Teddy flew into Vegas that day in 1960, it was allegedly Teddy that first pursued Judy or Judith. She was more impressed with Jack. That next day on the private patio of Sinatra's suite, Jack had a three-hour lunch with Miss Judith Campbell. Quote, 
largely devoted to seeking her views on Catholicism and politics. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, you told me that. I was like, what? Is that for real? Because I'm thinking they had a three-hour lunch. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, we talked about freaking religion. Leave it to Jack to be like, having a very, very, very sexual relationship and, and then still talking bring about- Bring it right back. <laughs> bring it right back. So now that we've got that over with, the fun is, is done. What do you think about Jesus Christ? <laughs> Not at all what I thought they'd be discussing. And then that night after the three-hour lunch with the mm-hmm. Catholicism and the politics- and the bobby pins falling out of the hair. No, I'm just kidding. That allegedly did not happen yet. Judith went to Frank's show at the Copa room of the Sands Hotel alongside Jack, Pat, and another woman. And the next morning, as Jack was on a plane back home, though they hadn't even kissed yet, Judith remembered, quote, feeling like Scarlett O'Hara the morning after Rhett Butler carried her up the stairs. It's the Jack effect. She said that Jack promised her that they would meet up again. Jack took her number, but that she didn't expect him to actually follow through. She reported then receiving a dozen roses and a dozen phone calls in the following weeks. A month later, Jack invited her to visit him at the Plaza Hotel in New York City, and they sealed the affair in his hotel room. Just to set the record nice and straight, The Plaza Hotel does not have Jack's photo on display, nor Judith Campbell Exner's, but Jackie's photo on display. Disregard the fact that Onassis is in the background. (laughs) And that Marilyn Monroe is right across. Yeah. (laughs) This was Judith's version of events. Evans, Peter's manager, was there that night. And he had a bit of a different take on their first introduction. I was there the night she met him. Pat and I were there at the Copa listening to Sinatra perform, and all of a sudden, she showed up. I didn't know who she was. She sat there, and I subsequently found out that she was a hooker, and she went upstairs with Jack for 200 bucks. That's why Frank Sinatra said, Hell hath no fury like a hooker who becomes an author. (laughs) According to Lawrence Lemer, quote, Campbell was what in the 50s would have been called a party girl. The radio journalist Blair Clark was there in Vegas that evening as well and confirms Evan's version of events. Quote, There were all these bimbos and showgirls standing around, and then there was one woman, quite attractive, with blue eyes and raven hair, whose name was Judith Campbell. A week after Jack had gone to bed with Judith Campbell, Frank Sinatra invited her to Florida where he had a residency of shows and introduced her to a companion, none other than Sam Giancana. Sam was the head mob boss of the Chicago outfit, the head of the Chicago mob, one of the most powerful mobs in the entire country and the one responsible for hundreds, if not thousands of hits. Murder. Hits. And the woman that is sleeping with him is also sleeping with Jack Kennedy. This was before he took office as president of the United States, but did it stop after he took office as president of the United States? No, it did not. She was still sleeping with the mob boss while she's sleeping with the president of the United States. (laughs) Sloppy (laughs) slut in the world. Did Jack know this, first of all? And second of all, what in the world was Frank Sinatra thinking? Ever. Ever. The the Frank Sinatra thing? You guess is as good as well. Like, he was just going and whoever wanted to come, he was just not thinking about politics at all He w- or public perception. And he was just, oh, this chick is a good time. Let's just bring her to all the parties. I think so, Yeah. I think he just wanted to keep everybody around him happy. But Jack had no idea. Frank knew. Jack, no idea. Judith had no idea. Judith Wait, Judith was, had no idea about what? Judith was, oh, sleeping, was sleeping with Sam with? Flood and oh, the president. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Frank knew she was sleeping with Sam Jean Connor and the president. So <laughs> it was a while into their relationship before Judith figured out who he really was. 
And according to her, according to her, quote, it was almost a year and a half before we became intimate. Who? Her and who? Sam. (laughs) I know. That makes zero sense to me whatsoever. It doesn't seem to line up. But during their relationship, Sam made up for his less than appetizing appearance and his gruff personality by showering Judith with lavish gifts, including <laughs> including just straight up cold, hard cash. And he was giving her all of this for- Exactly. Just company, companionship. People do that, but yeah. I don't know. But to answer your question, what was Frank ever thinking? He was smart- but he was also impulsive and wanted to keep all of his important friends on his good side. So maybe it was a panic decision. We talked about that in KFM 14, that he was just not wanting to lose his friendships and she was available and she was pretty. Who knows? But he had to know, at least to some extent, that he was playing with fire because Bobby roasted this man, Sam, relentlessly on the stand. They were enemies. They were literally the most opposing public figures that you could come up with. Bobby was chief counsel of the United States Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management, and Giancana was on the stand pleading the fifth. This is Bobby for you right here, okay? Bobby asked Mr. Giancana, Sam Flood Giancana, if he dealt with his opponents by stuffing them in trunks. The nerve of Bobby Kennedy. (laughs) He did not get an answer. Bobby asked him if he would tell him anything about his operations. And he just softly giggled in response. Bobby shot back. I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Gene Connor. How freaking frustrating though. Can you imagine? He's just silently like staring at you and like not answering anything. Lightly giggles. And he's like, (laughs) (laughs) so Bobby shot back. For his work on the McCarthy Committee, Bobby was included in a list of 10 outstanding young men of 1954 created by the U.S. Junior Chamber of Commerce. 10. Jack wasn't on the list. Bobby was. Then in 1955, Kennedy Bobby was admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court. Sounds pretty freaking qualified to me. Well, that's the thing. Bobby wasn't as qualified for the job as candidates normally were if Jack would have picked an attorney general, just any random person, not considering the honesty and the loyalty of having a family member in that post. But Jack never would have placed Bobby in that position if he wasn't experienced enough for the job. He was not just a random businessman who was put in a government position that he had no business being in or he didn't have experience in. He was already on that career path and he did, in fact, have quite a bit of relevant experience. Okay, this is from The Kennedy Women by Lawrence Lemer. The Lawfords were responsible for the Hollywood contingent and for Pat, this should have been a triumphant time. The pre-inaugural gala had been her glory almost as much as it was Peter's and Sinatra's for bringing together this glittery retinue of stars of culture and entertainment. She had stood next to Jack during part of the evening. She wore an alluring low-cut gown, but her body appeared too thin, like a tiny object wrapped in far too large a package. She sat there during the long evening as a parade of performers paid their tribute to the president-elect in song, melody, verse, and finally brought word. At the end of the long evening, Pat listened as Jack said a few concluding words. The happy relationship between the arts and politics, which has characterized our long history, I think reached culmination tonight, he said, standing in his black tie, a spotlight illuminating his handsome features. I know we're all indebted to a great friend, Frank Sinatra, and I want him and my sister Pat's husband, Peter Lawford, to know that we're all indebted to them and we're proud to have them with us. As Pat and Peter listened proudly to Jack's accolades, Bobby, the attorney general in waiting, turned toward Red Fay and other companions. Quote, I hope Sinatra will live up to the public position the president has given him by such recognition, he said in a voice scarcely above a whisper. Bobby had little use or time for Pat's Hollywood friends. 
<laughs> and what he considered their self-indulgent hijinks that might end up harming the president-elect. In preparing for the gala, Peter, Sinatra, and other Hollywood entertainers had flown to New York for a meeting to coordinate the gala. A prostitute had supposedly ended up dead. Her body dumped far from the hotel, the matter hidden away. What? And it was connected to them? How do they know? It was only one story among many stories, but Bobby hoped that it would be the end of the stories, the end of the rumors, and that Pat's friend would not prove a deadly albatross to Jack and the New Frontier. Oh my gosh. He's not saying like, I hope Sinatra will live up. He's like, I hope. He, they better if we can get their extra freaking together. As much as Pat reveled in her brother's triumph and basked in the reflected glory, she was still alone with her husband in a shell of a marriage. In recent months, Peter's philandering, indeed his separate life, had become notorious, even in a Hollywood community blasé about such manners. Wait. Or about such matters. So basically, he's, he's like, he's bad for Hollywood, you know? Yeah. Even for Hollywood, he's bad. Even for Hollywood, he stands out for this. Are we going to hear, uh, do you tell any more about the murder? <laughs> like, she- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. And then it's also in that book. This book doesn't have a bunch of like the, did Joe Sr. hire Sam Jean Connor to get votes in Chicago? Right. Da, da, da. Any of the like conspiracy. This is the Kennedy women, by the way. So- it is in Sinatra and the Jack Pack down there. So I'm going to read from that book, but I'm just kind of separating the stories and we will read more about this murder in that book. Okay. Wait, so Peter Lawford is like fully, fully, we're, like we talked about in Peter and Pat's episode, mm-hmm. working, playing, and basically living with these people. Yes. His father-in-law, so Joe Sr., believed that in marriages, it was appearances that mattered. <laughs> But Peter didn't care enough to put up a decent facade. Quote, Hey, come on, you should be with her. Evans admonished Peter when he told his manager that he was going to stay at the Statler Hilton Hotel during the inauguration and not at Hickory Hill with Pat. You're married, Peter. Oh, she doesn't care. Peter replied, Don't worry. Okay, so fun fact. Hickory Hill is Bobby and Ethel's estate. I think we mentioned it briefly in the Bouvier episodes, that Jack and Jackie bought it originally. Remember whenever Lee got super upset that Jackie was like moving into this big giant estate and getting this house made and she had like two house cleaners and a chef and two babies and a president for a husband or whatever? I can't remember exactly what the whole situation was, but I remember Lee being jealous and I'm pretty sure that's when... Jackie and Jack sold Hickory Hill to Bobby and Ethel. Okay. Yeah. RFK's Virginia home. Okay. Yeah. So Jackie's the one that like originally decorated Hickory Hill. Okay. Yeah. It says on American Experience, which I freaking love, it's PBS. <laughs> but their clan headquarters may have been in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, but the true center of the Kennedy political dynasty in the 50s and 60s was Hickory Hill, yep. the Virginia home of Robert and Ethel Kennedy. And that's also where Bobby slammed his fist on the table and said, So that was like their actual Do home something. Home, like where yeah, they literally. Mm-hmm. It says, and it's the one that they were like sitting there waiting to, to know, like in episode right. 13, when they're like all sitting to wait. Watching the TV. Or is he going to be president? Is he not? That's Hickory Hill. It says it was a wild informal mixture of a children's playground and a humming political headquarters. Described one regular visitor, invitations to Hickory Hill were highly coveted and no place better expressed the personality of its owners. Oh, I love it. But yeah, so Pat was staying at Hickory Hill with her sister and Bobby or with her sister-in-law and Bobby. Yeah, it says Bobby Bobby bought the state from his older brother, Jack, in 1956, shortly after Jacqueline had suffered a devastating miscarriage. Uh, Bobby's family clearly needed the room as Ethel was pregnant with the fifth of her 11 children. (laughs) Jack's like, here, you can have it. (laughs) Yeah, and I think this is when uh, Ethel goes and steals the neighbor's horse and rides it home. I think that was Hickory Hill. It's like in Virginia, they have all that farmland and and it was a little bit more away from the city. Okay. Um, Which I think is because Jackie loved to ride horses originally. Mm -hmm. Remember she did all those like races and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I think that that's why they got it there. And then the day that Jackie made Jack wait at the airport for hours and hours and hours, she was in Virginia that day riding horses as well. So that was why they picked it out, I think. And then Jackie decorated it. And then Ethel and Bobby took over. So whenever we mention Hickory Hill in this story, Pat is staying there with Ethel and Bobby at their home. And Peter wanted to stay down at the Hilton. Oh my gosh. It's literally supposed to be like a family event. We're celebrating the inauguration. And And Peter's piecing out, leaving his wife to go stay in a hotel. And then his manager's like, dude, you need to be with her. And he's like, nah, don't don't worry about it. Oh my gosh. I do think that's partly based in shame. Fast forward just a bit. In Los Angeles, Peter was slowly sliding down into an alcoholic haze. Pat tried to live as she had before Jack became president, but her life was slipping away too. She was drinking too much and she was drawn into a shadowy nexus of politics. Pat had an almost pathological need for privacy. When she picked up the phone and talked intimately to Jean or Eunice or Jack or argued with Peter in her powder room, she assumed that no one else was listening. Yet her words were probably being captured by surveillance experts. Fred Otash and two of his former associates said that he was hired by Jimmy Hoffa, the corrupt Teamster president, to gather information on the Kennedys and had bugged Lawford's home. This we are going to talk more about in the Maryland episode. Oh my gosh. Pat adored the genial camaraderie of the Hollywood celebrities, but one by one, they were leaving. Sinatra was the first to go, taken away by the exigencies of politics. Peter asked Sinatra to be the president's Palm Springs host on Jack's trip to Southern California in March 1962. Sinatra put in a helicopter pad, cottages for the Secret Service, even a flagpole on which the presidential flag would be unfurled. As attorney general, Bobby was making the most single-minded attack on organized crime in American history, and he warned Jack time and time again about Sinatra's unsavory connections. Quote, Everybody complains about my relationship with Sinatra, Jack confided to Charles Bartlett. Sinatra is the only guy who gives Peter Lawford jobs. And the only way I can keep this marriage going is to see that Peter gets jobs. So I'm nice to Frank Sinatra. Jack then may have compromised himself in large part to help his sister. When Bobby heard about the proposed stay, he became incensed. He was his brother's keeper. He could not abide Jack's associating with a man with such connections. Peter had the unenviable task of telling the singer that Jack would not be staying with him. Lawford recalled that Sinatra vented his spleen by destroying the concrete landing pad with a sledgehammer. Oh my gosh. I can just imagine him grabbing a sledgehammer, running out there. And just <laughs> oh no. Oh, the equivalent of throwing the clothes in the pool. Poor Frank Sinatra. Everyone was abandoning him. Yeah. He applied a different kind of sledgehammer to his friendship with Peter and Pat, banning them from his company. Oh my gosh. So he was, is that when he, Peter got kicked out of the Rat Pack? I'm sure. Wow. Pat had wanted, so Jack's trying to keep it all together. Bobby's like, sorry, <laughs> sorry guys. Blow Sunny it to Nara, smithereens. <laughs> Not happening. Oh my gosh, care. you're right. That's What's the difference doing? between Jack and Frank or Jack and Frank. Jack and Bobby right there. Right there. Yeah. I was like, I don't care who you are. I'll throw my mother in prison. Yeah. It's just the right the thing. The right thing to do. And Jack is like, oh, but that's my sister. Mm-hmm. Pat had wanted nothing more from Sinatra than the pleasure of his presence in her life. But nothing was simple anymore. Not even friendship. On his trip to Palm Springs, Jack ended up staying at the home of Bing Crosby. Marilyn Monroe flew down to be with the president, spending the night in his bedroom. She was Hollywood's reigning sex goddess, and there was an almost inevitability that Jack would have an affair with the actress. A, because he was obsessed with Hollywood. B, because he was obsessed with sex. (laughs) Correct. 
So we are obviously going to be talking a lot more about Miss Marilyn Monroe and Jack and uh-huh. the relationship. And I'm so excited for that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But are we going to be talking more about the whole Pat and Peter thing? Like the, the downfall of their marriage? Absolutely. And for sure, we will be hearing more and more about the unraveling of Pat and Peter. Probably we will keep most of it to the KFMs though. So if you are interested in the Hollywood stuff and Pat and Peter, make sure you listen to the KFMs because a lot of that is going to be hidden in there. On another one of Jack's West Coast trips, Otash, remember Fred Otash, is the former LA police officer turned blackmailing like dirty cop who got kicked out of the force, who Who then disguised himself as a private investigator. Who who helped Peter Lawford bug his wife. Yes, Pat. He like sold him the equipment and said, Peter was too cheap to let me put it, let me install it, but I showed him how. So what was it about the 1960s where everyone was bugging everything? Yeah, so Otash said- It's like this new technology. Oh my God, we can record people's conversations. I think so. Let's just go ham. Mm Mm-hmm. Like yeah. people have more access and it way, it's way easier to do that now and less people do Nobody it. Nobody cares. And everyone was just paranoid. Like the- Yes, I guess the that's, that's what it was. Everyone country was as a whole. Freaking out. Yeah. yeah. Because that you started to hear about stuff like that. Yeah. And the government was doing stuff like that. And then we're like, yeah, they're listening to freaking everything. <laughs> everything we say. We know. Who cares? I guess it's true. We are all being bugged. Yeah. More people we, are being bugged now. We just don't we care. Just, we're like- It's a fact of life now. Back then, it wasn't. It was weird. So this is a new book that we really only have used for KFM, no, for episode 14. Sinatra and the Jack Pack, the extraordinary friendship between Frank Sinatra and John F. Kennedy, why they bonded and what went wrong by Michael Sheridan with David Harvey. This one, I'm not positive on 100% of the details and the legitimacy of every word involved. So these are the stories that could be like, you know, 85% true and then we don't know about the rest. But honestly, in that circle, what is the truth? That's exactly Nobody it. knows. Yep. Yep. This book communicates the exact same Judith Campbell and Jack meeting and then the five days and then the dozen roses and the dozen phone calls and then the one month later, the Plaza Hotel. That's all the same. Now, this story is one that I haven't found in other books. It's just in this one. So we'll read it, but who knows? Joe reportedly approached Sinatra to seek the help of Sam Giancana in Illinois and more importantly, in West Virginia. What? On the home turf in Illinois, Giancana and his associates could deliver any amount of Chicago district votes, but West Virginia was a different matter and would demand a bit more orders from the boss. $50,000 was reportedly handled by Giancana associate Paul D'Amato, who dispersed the money as bribes to key election figures and to officials who could deliver votes. After the primary, the FBI recorded a number of complaints about bribery and the buying of votes. A future FBI wiretap would record Giancana complaining about the lack of appreciation by Sinatra and the Kennedys for his help in Illinois and West Virginia. So I don't know if that's really in the FBI file. I don't know if he was just like high on himself and saying stuff, you know? Yeah. He, like, I could totally see. I could see both. hmm I feel like what I don't see is the huge, huge benefit and like the risk being worth the reward there. Yeah. Agreed. Cause like that's unless one, he was just like so desperate and like frantic in a moment and was like being stupid. Well it's like one or two states, first of all. Second of all, allegedly Judith Campbell Exner, which this is pretty widely accepted that she didn't know who Sam Jane Connor was before Jack was elected president. Yeah. So how would like I guess Joe Sr. would have just had to get information out of Sinatra directly to know who he was and to coordinate with him. So neither Jack nor Judith would have been aware. Aware. That would be my guess. Or, yeah, this dude was just freaking- Using his- He was like, oh, why? Exactly. Acting like he was someone he wasn't. 
wanting because to get he was for kind of close to do. the Kennedy operation. Like he he could kind of pull it off that, that it he might was make sense with them. Yeah, and that he had he was so powerful, and basically it's the only reason that Jack was president. A and B could have been a little bit delusional, actually. Like right, like believed Frank Sinatra, that, but believed right. Oh, like we Frank. like know each other kind of, and look what I can do. Aren't I such a good friend? You want to keep me around? Kind of, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Because people like that are looking to perception. Yes, they want to control the narrative because the narrative matters when you're a gangster. Oh yeah. The extent to which the mob helped to influence the vote in West Virginia is impossible to calculate, but it was not essential. So Jack won by a landslide and why would they have needed they those? didn't need yeah. the votes. So it's just like I don't understand the risk being worth the reward only in these random two States. locations yeah. that like it sounds a lot more like a local uh, story, some small town drama. Yeah. Kennedy took 61% to Humphrey's 39%. So it wasn't a close call. No, I just, I don't really see it. Judith, meanwhile, had continued to be at the beck and call of Sinatra, not for his own sexual needs, but as with the case of Jack Kennedy, to be offered to friends or associates whom he wished to impress. So this meeting of Sam Flood and Judith Campbell is also the same in this book. Sinatra was performing a series of concerts at the Fontainebleau and introduced her to Sam Flood. The name was one of a number of aliases used by Sam Giancana. Frank omitted to inform her of Giancana's real identity, something she would later discover. It did not deter her, however, from getting involved in a sexual liaison just as dangerous as the one she was having with Jack. Had she known more about the man she was now also involved with, it's unlikely she would have stuck around for too long. <sighs> he just, he was a bad, bad dude. Also not worth the risk for her. Yeah, like, clearly. So that one's on Frank. <laughs> yeah, it's sad that Frank got cut off from people that he was trying to be friends with and love. You just can't. You can't. I mean, making these types of decisions too. Dude. He really just dug his own grave. Frank Sinatra did not lack intelligence, but he was impulsive. <laughs> what none of the parties to this unfolding drama knew was that this unseemly relationship had drawn the unwelcome attention of J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI. The director had instructed his agents to keep the situation under close watch and would soon introduce wiretaps into the equation. Oh, more wiretaps, you mean? More wiretaps. In March 1960, allegedly, Hoover received communication from the New Orleans Bureau, which stated that an informant with access to the mob in the Miami area had learned that underworld members, including Joe Fischietti, Remember him? Yep. And other hoodlums were actively endeavoring to secure the nomination for Kennedy. The one, the one that Sinatra flew to Cuba with to deliver the $2 million. Mention was also made of Frank Sinatra and his support for the campaign. The informant had overheard a conversation that indicated that Kennedy was compromised by a relationship with a woman, but he was unable to give a name in the report. This was an obvious reference to Judith Campbell. The informant also said that Confidential Magazine was, which that's, see, this is all just like so inter, it's, it's like a gossipy. It's just so all inter coming from the same place because mm -hmm. Confidential Magazine got a ton of its information from freaking Fred Otash, who bugged the Kennedy Lawford home and who sold the, it's like, Fred bugged the Lawford home for the Lawfords, for Peter, and also for the Jimmy Hoffa. And yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like these people. Like, we're just all corrupt. They're all corrupt. So they're all, they're all working both sides and they're all lying like, and they're all trying angles. to make themselves look better. So what even is true? So Confidential Magazine, Fred Otash's like basically magazine, was investigating a rumor relating to a party which had been held in Palm Springs with Kennedy, Sinatra, and Lawford present. The publication was a Hollywood muckraking tabloid with huge circulation that employed the services of former LAPD police officer 
turned notorious private eye Fred Otash. Confidential claimed to have the affidavits of two prostitutes in New York that implicated Sinatra and Kennedy, citing them as clients. So really what Frank and Jack both did was associate with the wrong people, yeah. which made these lies or this gossip, the speculation, believable, have any sort of grounds whatsoever. So yeah, it just like held up whatever anyone wanted to say. Well, that makes sense because I saw so-and-so with so-and-so and that's suspicious. And which is Jack why is hanging out with someone who is super close and extremely involved with the mob. And then guess what? He's also sleeping with someone who is super involved and hanging out with the mob. Which is why normal people and kids go to prison all the time for crimes they did not commit because their friends were there. And if you're hanging out with those people, it's really freaking hard to prove that you would never do something like that. Or or that you weren't there or that whatever. Or that your intentions are different than the people that you hang out with. So it just isn't as believable. So this is all going on while Sinatra is publishing High Hopes. High Hopes and... High hopes, Jack's version. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Meanwhile, after the convention, Jack Kennedy had little time to indulge in any such exploits, but he did manage to hook up with Judy Campbell twice in August. He also traveled to Las Vegas to party with Sinatra, and there were visits to the Lawfords in Santa Monica. August also saw the premiere of Ocean's Eleven in Las Vegas, and Sinatra and the Rat Pack were out in force. So that is like some calibration on the timeline. Mm Mm-hmm. So they didn't call off Sinatra until 1962 and okay. Ocean's Eleven came out in August 1960. So Jack wasn't even president yet. Okay. On December 12th, Sinatra was at the Sands in Vegas when Salinger called. Bad news, Frank, said Kennedy's new press secretary jokingly. You're not going to make the cabinet, but the president wants you to be his secretary of entertainment. And that was exactly the role Frank would play. Sinatra became primarily in charge of the inaugural gala. Gala? Gala? Gala. (laughs) Um, To be staged on the eve of the inauguration ceremony, a sour note was struck with the forced exclusion of Sammy Davis Jr. This is the one we talked about in Cave in 14. Despite his willingness to be involved in the 1960 campaign, Sammy had been largely frozen out on the instructions of the Kennedy Sr. Okay, so it was Joe Sr. When Joe adjudged that Davis's engagement to white Swedish actress May Britt was too politically risky to his son in an America where interracial marriage was banned in 31 states. Despite Joe's vehement and continuing objections, Sinatra made a number of attempts to put Davis back on the bill. At one stage, appealing directly to Jack Kennedy, but gave up when it became clear that Joe's word on the matter was final. And that's that's the JFK that we will see kind of change and transform over his presidency. Yeah, as his eyes open up Mm -hmm. a bit, his brain opens up (laughs) a little freaking bit. My gosh. (laughs) Call back the last- Crack it wide open. Last episode or like he just did not live in that world. He did not understand at all. He didn't get the importance and the the weight of it. Yeah, and Joe was just freaking- selfish. Joe, yeah, exactly. Joe's just trying to watch his own freaking back. Mm -hmm. JFK was not going to rock the boat over a minor sideshow to what was now promising to be a very special event. And that is the difference between Jack and Bobby. Yeah. Where Bobby could go head to head with his father. Jack did not have the backbone that Bobby did. Davis was understandably devastated to be pushed out of the historic lineup, particularly given the fact that at Joe's behest, he had delayed his marriage until May, until after the election. Oh my gosh. Yeah, this is stupid. This This is is awful. Not stupid. Yeah, this is evil. Horrible. Along with Dave Powers, O'Donnell had become JFK's closest confidant and one of the people Kennedy relied on most for support and practical advice. Now, as de facto chief of staff, his challenge would be to loyally serve the interests of his boss, the president, while maintaining his lifelong friendship with the attorney general. (laughs) This is, okay, so O'Donnell, O'Donnell is the one who, I'm still thinking about this whole other, (laughs) sorry, we're going to talk so much more about civil rights with the Kennedys, but O'Donnell, I'm almost positive that he's the one that 
basically elected John F. Kennedy because he is the one who, when Jack was running for Senate, I believe, was like, Bobby, you got to go in there. You got to go help. Okay, yeah. And Jack was like, that. you went freaking behind my back and talked to my brother and da, 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 da. And O'Donnell's like, you need him. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you are expecting to accomplish anything, Bobby, you have to do it. And Bobby's like, I don't freaking want to. And they're kind of just fighting about it. And then they As both siblings, were like, and then okay. I was like, okay, let me just help you guys see a little clearer. Literally. What needs to happen. So... O'Donnell had been Bobby's like childhood friend for a long time. And then he was working for Jack's campaign. And that's how he connected the two. He was like, okay. Bobby, I know you, you'd be good at this. And somebody's got to put out the fire. <laughs> so yeah. Cause if we were up to Jack, Jack is freaking not standing up for what's right. No. And Jack allowing it- horrible people to hang out with him and take his freaking. Yeah. Jack will let it burn to the ground. Yeah. He's here to have fun. Um, so now O'Donnell is the one that's the de facto chief of staff and he becomes a very very close confidant with Jack and on the subject of Sinatra it was clear the opinions of the two brothers differed dramatically so O'Donnell's trying to to juggle my best friend Bobby from childhood who is the attorney general and Jack who I'm supposed to be loyal to and is... The actual president. The president. <laughs> and their brothers. Boss, yeah. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. Stress. Stress. Because although Jack is president, Bobby's the one with the teeth. Yeah. Bobby's the actual terrifying one. Mm-hmm. The one that you don't want to have to confront. I wouldn't want to confront either of them. No. Jack which it just doesn't listen and is like, it's fine. It'll all be fine. Yeah. And Bobby's like, it's not fine. Go tell him again. And you're like, uh-huh. I'm just freaking. I promise I talk to him. And he's he like, doesn't care. I know. Talk to him again. <laughs> um, the list of the number of ways in which the president elect had used Sinatra was growing. He'd availed of Frank's hospitality in Las Vegas and Palm Springs and keenly encouraged him to introduce him to as many women as he could. He and his father had covertly used the mob through Sinatra during the West Virginia primary and the election to get the vote out and to, in some cases to fix the entire electoral area, which I just, I don't know about that. He had used Frank to encourage his Hollywood and entertainment industry friends to support the Kennedy presidential campaign with endorsements, contributions, whatever, whatever, whatever. So in exchange, Sinatra had basked and was about to bask even more in the warm glow of Kennedy's celebrity. Jack's patronage was not only reaffirming Frank's boasts that he had a direct line to the president, it was, in his view, rehabilitating him in the eyes of the American people who had adored him until things had begun to unravel in the 1940s, which is what we talked about in episode 14. The 10-week period between the election of Jack Kennedy in November 1960 and his inauguration in January 1961 was probably make-your-mind-up time for Sinatra. Would he choose the Kennedys and some sort of respectability and rehabilitation in the eyes of the American public or the familiar faces of the Cosa Nostra? Instead of making the right decision, (laughs) he would have to pay a costly penance. Despite receiving invitations to all of the inaugural events, Judith Campbell did not attend. I just don't even understand that. I don't know if Jack would have invited her to that. I don't know. I don't know. According to Judy, who had seen Jack on at least a dozen occasions during the campaign, she did not want to flaunt herself in front of her lover's wife on the most important day of her life. I don't know if I believe that. That just sounds like Judy being like, oh, well, I was invited, but I I couldn't. I wanted to be kind. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't Especially with the way that she tells the whole. Yeah, the introduction evening. Yeah, of course. If Hoover disliked Sinatra and his mob associates, he actively despised the Kennedys and his direct superior, Robert Kennedy, the new attorney general in particular. (gasps) Oh. I didn't even think about Mm -hmm. that. That arrogant whippersnapper, as he described him. I can definitely see that. They'd be freaking annoying. Every single one of them. Oh, absolutely. Freaking annoying coworker. Oh, yeah. And who died and made you queen? (laughs) Yeah. To every single one of you. 
Who gave you the right? No one. No one gave them the right. Nobody. Nobody gave Eunice the right. With previous presidents, Hoover just like told people what to do and people just approved it. Not going to fly Not with the Kennedys. Not going to fly with, with Bobby. Would fly with Jack probably. Yeah. The freaking Cuban Missile Crisis. Basically, Jack and Bobby had a lot more to say about how Hoover should run the FBI than did the previous presidents. And they were just freaking annoying as well. And so Hoover started to be very, very annoyed by them and became increasingly upset. So then he, in return, turned their lives into hell and was basically harassing Bobby about communist concerns regarding Jack and who he was associating with endlessly, 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 to the point that Bobby turned to Kenny O'Donnell, his childhood friend that worked for Jack, and thumped the desk, calling the director, uh, Hoover, a... What? (laughs) He was basically just throwing insults at Hoover, screaming at O'Donnell, and then Hoover's response to Bobby just, like, stonewalling was to issue a tide of memos over the next five months relating to sexual indiscretions of people in power, including the president's weakness for casual casual sex encounters. So it's like full-on warfare. Warfare within the government. Yes, within familiar, like it is friendly fire. And then the Kennedy camp decided they can't fire Hoover because he will be more of an issue outside right. of his job. Keep your enemies close. Exactly. So then the FBI director then chronicled the connection between Frank and a host of top mafia figures. The names rolled damningly from the pages. Joseph and Rocco Fischietti, cousins of Al Capone, New Jersey crime boss Willie Moretti, Mickey Cohen of Los Angeles, and of course, Sam Giancana. The document went on to report that Frank and Dean had also attended a soiree at the home of the notorious hoodlum Anthony Accardo and recounted the story about Frank's private number being among the items in Giancana's wallet when he was arrested in 1958. The more the attorney general read, the worse it got. The text then detailed how in the summer of 1959, Frank had hosted a nine-day party in Atlantic City's Claridge Hotel, which had been attended by some Chicago mob boss members and East Coast cohorts, including Vito Genovese and Tommy Lucis. Hoover's thesis was that even if Sinatra had not been found guilty of any criminal activity, his extensive association with mafia figures was more than sufficient proof that the Kennedy administration should have nothing to do with him. In spite of Bobby Kennedy's hatred of Hoover, it was an argument that at the very least made him pause for thought. Sinatra and his brother had been very friendly, but Frank had perhaps unwittingly brought a lot of trouble the way of the Kennedys. So then Frank's probably getting a little bit wise to what's going on and probably noticing a little hesitance between JFK and him and probably feeling like, okay, JFK is president now. He's like too busy for me. So then he starts love bombing the White House. He starts sending gifts every freaking week and records and letters, letters and all kinds of things. And the staff is like opening this stuff. And there are some correspondence back and forth from like thank you notes from Jack's staff and then thank you notes from Jack himself. And then in July, 1961, Jack apparently had plans to stay at Frank's house and sent a telegram that said, Peter and I hope to see you in a few weeks, Frank. So then the editor of an entertainment trade magazine got in touch with Salinger, who's Jack's staff, and said, hey, Basically, Frank was doing the whole Judith and the Sam thing where he's like making his connections with the president We're way so more dramatic than they close. are. Exactly. Yeah. It may be of interest to you that there is a persistent rumor that Frank Sinatra is having a house constructed adjoining his residence in Palm Springs specifically as a vacation home for the president. It was no rumor. So then Salinger goes wait, to Bobby. Literally, so Frank Sinatra is building a house. Building a house on his property for, for the president, for Jack to come and stay and all Jack the time. never asked for it. <laughs> no. We will later on talk about Jack's participation 
in his relationship with Judith Campbell Exner, which is going on this whole time too. And that might be another little reason why Jack didn't totally want to cut off Sinatra. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's so sad too, though, because Jack's like totally leading him on kind of. Yeah. Like I understand how Frank Sinatra and his warped, traumatized Yeah, self-important world. That, that he's like, dude, we are best friends. We are BFFs. Mm-hmm. I mean, he literally had him organize the whole gala. Yeah. And he's so, corresponding still. Yeah. And he's still saying thank you and stuff. He, uh-huh. he really is leading him on. Well, then Bobby Kennedy during this entire time is waging war against organized crime and all of Frank Sinatra's best friends. It so really is it like just, Bobby thinks it's more serious. Well, not doesn't think it's more serious than it is, but he's taking it super seriously. Yes. Jack doesn't think it, it's as serious as it is. Uh-huh. And they're just not at all on the same page. And then all the people in between are freaking the frick out. Yes, exactly. At the end of February, Hoover dropped his bombshell. I think this is February 1962. In identical memos to Bobby Kennedy and Kenny O'Donnell, he informed both that the president had been having a relationship with Judy Campbell and she in turn had been involved with the mob boss and criminal suspect Sam Giancana. The person responsible for making the various interactions was Frank Sinatra, another suspect of the FBI surveillance. Like this is just, this is the, pre- you're the president. You just can't do this. Like, <sighs> Hoover's kind of right. If the attorney general did not feel he could advise the president to adopt cutting Frank Sinatra off, then Hoover would do so himself. Basically, Hoover was going to freaking do something about it and the Kennedys did not want that to happen. So Bobby finally is like, all right, that's it. We have to take control of the situation. So they just, JFK has too much access to two, like he- He's a seven in- ultimate position that everybody wants to hang out with you. That and also like Frank Sinatra is not thinking about the fact that Jack Kennedy is leaving the United States of America vulnerable and exposed to yeah. foreign warfare. People are like he having he, too much fun and playing and not realizing what they're playing with. Right. You don't get to be here and, and also like, we're be talking that. about nuclear bombs and the Red Scare is happening and World War Two isn't that far away. No. And you're hanging out with all of these people and Marilyn Monroe well, is hanging out is, with all yeah, these people who are during a hugely vulnerable atom bomb of America. a uh, yes, yeah. of a moment. Like We will talk more about that in upcoming episodes. Like people are paranoid for a reason. Yep. So Peter and Pat were still very close to Frank at the time, but- It's almost like the whole Ingabigia thing. Yeah, it is. It's just like you- Just in case these people are spies, you just can't be doing this. You just can't. If you want to be who you are, then you have to act like who you are. Yeah. But clearly Jack doesn't like that. If you're married, you can't be sleeping around. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is Peter Lawford. Quote, It fell to me to break the news to Frank, and I was scared. Lawford told Sinatra biographer Kitty Kelly. He went on to say, When Jack called me, he said that as president, he just couldn't stay at Frank's and sleep in the same bed that Giancana or any other hood had slept in. You can handle it, Peter. Jack had said in his Massachusetts drawl. Jack had called only after Kennedy let the president know that encouraging Peter to do the deed might need the weight of the commander-in-chief behind it. So uh, Kenny's like, Bobby's not calling. Jack, you are going to show your full support behind this decision. You're going to call Peter. Peter's going to call Frank. We're not pawning this off on little brother. Yeah. Everyone needs to know that JFK is no longer associated with Frank Sinatra. Per JFK's mouth. Exactly. So that is when Jack ended up staying at Bing Crosby's house instead. Frank goes and gets the sledgehammer and busts up the helipad. Thus also kind of blowing up Pat's world too. Mm -hmm. Because now what she's facilitating is all busting to smithereens. Jackie's in the corner going, see, I told Told you. you. (laughs) And I knew this was going to happen the whole time. Yep. And that's so sad too with, because from Frank's perspective, he 
isn't hearing everything that Hoover is complaining about. He doesn't know what all is going no. on behind the scenes and the pressure that they're all getting put in. He also like doesn't the, have the filter to be able to understand, realize like, how yeah. important all of that is and what a big deal it is. And, and so he just feels absolutely blindsided yeah. and abandoned. When Lawford made the call, his official line quickly crumbled and he confessed that it was Bobby who had really decided that the president could not stay with Frank. Peter? Peter <laughs> just immediately crumbled. Sinatra was having none of it, accusing Lawford of setting the whole thing up at Crosby's before slamming the phone down. Frank then called Bobby in Washington to be told that the reason for the cancellation was the disreputable company he was keeping and the need for the administration to distance himself from people such as himself. Sinatra called the attorney general every name in the book before slamming the phone down. Frank is then alleged to have gone around the house, smashing up everything in his way before taking a sledgehammer to the concrete helipad outside. Despite his temper, whether he did anything quite so dramatic is debatable. What is certain, however, is that he was deeply wounded by what he regarded as a huge personal insult to him. And again, Black Robert has to be the bad guy. Leave it to Bobby to freaking just absolutely tell the truth. <laughs> and freaking Peter, bro, you're supposed to yeah, be- Yeah, he just caves, just snaps. He's like, like, it was Bobby, it was Bobby. Don't burn my jeans, don't burn my jeans and don't break my legs. It's sad though, because like, why did they make, they shouldn't have made Peter do that. They were the ones that were actually friends. Yeah. Of course it's gonna freaking hurt. Oh my gosh. Okay, I don't know if I want to freaking reveal this yet, to be honest. Okay, let's not. So dot, dot, dot on the Maryland thing. We'll return. Happy birthday. Out for lunch. We'll return soon. Join us here next week to hear all about Bobby and Ethel's love story. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business.